Hello, everybody, and welcome to this very special episode of Painted in Color. I am co-host Lauren Brown, and I'm joined today with a beautiful panel of really talented artists for Lightbox Expo. Hello, all. I'm joined today by Mia Araujo. Let's start first with you. Kristen Garland. Bree Henderson. Edgywa Ebeneve, or Edge. And Eric Wilkerson. And today we are going to talk about our art and how we profit off of it with our passions, profit and passion. So we are going to have a wonderful magma board today where we're all drawing the things that we are most passionate about and the things that we self-indulge ourselves with. So let's start right there. All right, we have our magma board and we're already starting. But uh, <laughs> we are going to draw our self-indulgences today while we talk about how we uh, passion, how we profit off of our passions is basically what it is, which sounds really terrible, but it's really not, I promise. Um, <laughs> let's start by introducing ourselves, though. Um, let's start with Mia. Please tell me about yourself and um, I guess who you are and uh, what your background is really quick. Um, yeah, I'm Mia Araujo. I'm an independent artist and writer. I've been exhibiting my work uh, for the past 14 years, uh, uh, galleries, online, and at conventions. And I recently started writing and illustrating my own uh, illustrated novel. That's uh, my own reimagining of Alice in Wonderland. And uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. I guess I grew up in LA. My parents are from Argentina. I, I don't know what else you want to know. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, hi everybody. My name is Kristen and I am a visual development artist currently working at Netflix Animation. Um, what else are we supposed to talk about? <laughs> I, mean, that's, I think that's good. That's a good place to start. Oh, sweet. Yeah, I, I, I draw on stuff. <laughs> All right, Brie, you're next. Hi, I'm Brie. <laughs> you're welcome. Get <laughs> out. <laughs> we bow at your feet. <laughs> um, I also work at, uh, I was gonna say Cartoon Network, why? Uh, I also work at Netflix <laughs> with the ever adoring Kristen Garland. So we're Aww. on different, um, I, I work in feature and she works in TV. Um, I also work for Marvel, and I'm I'm a consultant on Clone High. I hope y'all remember that show. It's awesome. It's coming back. I love that show. Yeah, and I'm 30. Mm -hmm. I just turned 30, and I feel it in my knees. So. Woo! 30, flirty, and thriving, oh, and yeah. free. Yes. All right, we're gonna go to Eric next. Uh, um, my <laughs> uh, golly. Where to begin? <laughs> no, um, so I I am a freelance illustrator and uh, um, illustration in instructor. Um, I I paint black kids having sci-fi fantasy adventures for a living. Yes. That's my that's my thing, <laughs> officially. Hell yeah! Um, so uh, I got a bunch of stuff coming out in stores this fall, next year, year after that, doing magic cards and all that stuff. So it uh, keeps me firmly locked in this room. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Eric. No. It's so sad. It's actually so sad. <laughs> all right. And last but not least is Edge. Hey. Yeah, so I'm Edge. Um, I'm an artist, fantasy illustrator, artist living in um, Burnaby in BC. Um, and I mainly focus on whimsical, joyful, hyper colorful um, depictions of, yeah, black people having fun and just like, you know, living life and thriving. Um, yeah, and I love to explore that side of things. Yeah. <laughs> Making happy art instead of, yeah, that happy art that stuff. counteracts, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that other stuff. Exactly. Happy art that counteracts like all the negative narratives that love to be pushed about us. And yeah, that's all to do. <laughs> over here doing the best work. And I am Lauren Brown. Um, I'm an illustrator and uh, art director working at Zynga currently, um, living in Austin, Texas. Um, I have my background in television animation, working on shows like Archer, um, all of a sudden in Philadelphia, The League, and moved into the game industry about five years ago. So um, I've been 
uh, working on games like The Simpsons Stepped Out and Harry Potter Puzzles and Spells and now Wars with Friends and I'm art directing for that game. So that's where I'm at right now. And um, yeah, that's a little bit about me, but let's get into it. And also side note, my um, Cintiq has decided to just not today, oh, as you can no. see. So oh, that's yeah. not fun. <laughs> that's oh, no. not fun. Okay, so um, let's start with this. Um, I'm really curious to know for all of you, what kind of stuff do you do for fun? What kind of stuff that, that you do you do that you're passionate about? The things that you draw that like time goes away and you just zen out on it and you just really, you do it to relax. Uh, Mia, what kinds of things do you draw for fun? I'll start with you. Oh man, I mean, anything that's figurative, like faces especially, I just love, like, uh, I just love trying to capture people's beauty, like every single nuance of the face or even the figure. Like I grew up loving figure drawing and um, that's definitely something I could zen out to. And I can actually picture myself as like a 90 year old woman. Like when my faculties are gone, I can't string sentences together <laughs> or, or tell stories anymore. I would be happy to just plop me down in front of anybody and like, let me draw their portrait. And I'd be so happy just doing that. <laughs> oh, I love that. All right, Kristen, what about you? Oh man, um, I think I, I like to get real noodly. I really love drawing plants and getting all the veins and the, the variegation that happens on the different leaves, it, which is funny because that's not the first thing that I drew here right now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I really enjoy um, rendering those. And then also I think like anything that has to do with a story, like I'll usually do sketches and doodles and entry and like build a world that way and even though the chicken scratch like it's chicken scratch to anybody else to me I'm just like oh yeah I'm writing I'm creating right now so <laughs> mm. some, sometimes it's just nice to like have a moment where you're brainstorming and you're not really worried about the finished product so I really enjoy that process I can relate to that all right Eric what about you well I like working on a oil painting of my daughter that I started when she was nine months old. And uh, I just haven't gotten around to finishing it. She is six, so. Oh, yeah, Eric, you need to finish it. Yeah, so, uh, but my, my, when I'm not painting stuff for money, um, like I, I just, I like sci-fi art. I just, I really love doing that stuff. So uh, my, my personal work and my professional work kind of blend together. Um, so like, I'm not out there just painting landscapes or like, or, you know, plain air stuff like you see some people do. I just, <laughs> I, that's not me, but um, I sculpt sometimes. Um, and uh, been working on this really large painting for, I guess, a year or so now, just nit picking away at it, like a whole alien abduction scene. Yeah. So, um, like, uh, kind of inspired by, like, what Mia did this Alice in Wonderland piece mm -hmm. where she's got, like, all these characters in this, like, uh, interior setting. I don't remember. I don't know where, where, where exactly it is, but um, in her story. But I'm like, I, I need to do a big multi-figure oil painting just for myself and just hang it on a wall. I don't know. Do you guys paint, like paint, paint? Yeah, or, I do. Yeah, <laughs> I should. <Barely. laughs> Edge, what do you, uh, what do you, what do you paint in? What do you, what do you do? Acrylics, oils, what? Uh, both. I do both? acrylics and oils. Yeah. Um, and then I also have been doing a bit of a little bit of gouache, teeny bit, and a teeny bit of water, watercolor as well. Um, but yeah, mostly acrylic and oil, say, and pencil colors. Color pencils as well to enhance the acrylics if I feel like adding more detail on top of stuff. Yeah. That's awesome. Ash, what do you do for fun? What, what kind of stuff do you love to do? Just oh, yourself. Yeah, I love, I just love like really just bright, colorful, windy, overlapping <laughs> details and um, shapes and yeah, basically just clusters of things. I love to just get in there and like detail. <laughs> Oh, yeah. uh, random things so I've been really into lately like I love organic forms in general and so I've been really into um, like fruit clusters and 
adding them to portraits, flowers, and all that sort of stuff. So kind of exploring that at this point. <laughs> All right, and Bree. Mm. What was the question again? What do you love to draw for yourself on your, mm. your spare time? What do you What do you love to draw that you're most passionate about? Ah, ah. Uh, <laughs> that cackle. <laughs> I mean, I I like to draw smut. I really do. It's either that or I'll really start to take heavy inspiration from like Japanese ukiyo-e paintings or mm. Greek tragedies and I'll start to come up with my own stories um I really like to did a whole series on um these characters who we perceive them as human but they're actually animals kind of like wolf's reign Ooh. and they all had like a bunch of arrows sticking out of them because they've been shot by hunters or whatever but I love drawing stuff like that anything that's like like tastefully erotic that's my absolute favorite that's where my pure happiness comes in because i mean i also get to look at really naughty stuff for reference so there's that too <laughs> yeah great i can relate yeah and for me the things that i love to draw uh, in my own time um i really love to draw outfits made out of different materials that are from nature like mushrooms and flowers and plants and coral and different things like that. Um, Cause I'm just fascinated with the forms of all these things that are in nature. And I'm also fascinated with the amount of things that you can put on like the figure, like avant-garde fashion and mm -hmm. how you can just like transform those things to look like other materials. And that's just something that I'm obsessed with. Um, you know, I grew up with a dad as a fashion designer. So I think that's where the interest came from in the first place, but um, yeah, that's something that I just really, really love to draw. And so I'm doing a whole series right now um, called The Avant Garden that I would love to finish and make an art book of. But one day, one day it will happen. I have to balance that with doing freelance, or sorry, not freelance work, full-time work. But um, if I can get it done, then I would love to, to publish that and make it a thing. But yeah, cool. Thanks, everybody. Um, so I'm curious, uh, for the professional side of things, when did you start monetizing your work? Like, when did you start making money off of what you were doing, whether or not it was the thing that you were passionate about or just for your skill set alone. Um, and I'll start, uh, let's start with Kristen. What? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Don't act shocked. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, so true, true, I started making money off of my artwork back, like, okay, not, are we talking about professionally? Or are we talking about like, I'm a low, low, like. <laughs> I mean, both, it could be either. I mean, <laughs> making money off of your art is professional, is it not? Sure, sure, yeah, because like, okay, back in high school and middle school, like, I would have friends that would come up to me or other classmates and like, because I was a kid that was just always drawing and low key, that's, I feel like that's how I made a lot of friends. <laughs> it's yeah. just like, like I would draw in a corner and be all shy and people come over and be like, wow. <laughs> draw my character and I'm like all right let's just keep talking to me um, <laughs> but um I had I had like family members and friends who were like really supportive of my work and would um ask me to do commissions of stuff and at first I would do it for free and then over time people were like you should really charge um so I did and so I think that was really went like some of my first paid gigs and then if we're talking about like working at a studio or or my first freelance gig doing like concept art it was i think maybe a year after i graduated from college or a few months after i graduated from college i was still really trying to learn a lot about digital painting at the time and i how, how did I meet this guy? I think it was like my dad was talking to somebody and he was like a friend of a friend and he was creating a a short film that he wanted me to create work for and that's and that's how I first started and at first it seemed really um intimidating because they wanted like a full-on like characters with like a really dramatic cinematic background and I didn't know how to do any of that at the time so it was very much like just fake it till you make it. <laughs> Figure it out all the way. <laughs> so yeah, those are those are my first jobs. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. Um, let's go to let's see who I want to who I want to pick on. Um, Bree. Ah. 
Me? Yeah. Hi. Um, I'm skipping around. <laughs> so when did I start mon like first start monetizing? Um, yes. You know, it's really I actually don't know. Um, I don't know. I, I think it started probably when I was in school. Um, in my last year or two, it's probably when I around when I met Kristen, because I tabled at CTN once, and I was like, "Oh my God, it's another black artist! Oh. <laughs> Talented. She's even got a table." Um, but it was it was probably the year after, so maybe 2017, that I got tabled at you know CTN for the very first time, and. I was starting to get really serious about wanting to work in animation. And then I graduated in 2018. And my first job was in 2000, probably right after with Marvel. And so I think that's sort of when I started learning the worth of my art. But also, like, I've now, in 2021, I've realized, like, I don't, I don't need to monetize what I do as outside of, like, the professional world. And so, like, I was contemplating tabling in person at CTN because I just, I missed that interaction so much. And I was just going to sell shit for 25 cents to a dollar, like stuff that'll usually cost either 25 cents to a dollar to make. And then, you know, you upsell the hell out of that, but why not? You know, I, I want to do it for the interaction with people and, and meet the younger crowd, see who's going to take my job in the next couple of years. But yeah, that's, it's really interesting how it's changed from like me, like making art to make money and then losing sight of making art for the fun of it. Mm -hmm. And now that I have maybe one too many jobs under my belt, I want to go back to making art for the fun of it. Does mm -hmm. that answer your question? I hope that helps. Pretty, no, that's very helpful. <laughs> that's a good answer. All right, Edge, what about you? Um, sorry, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> when did you first start uh, monetizing your, your art and like, um, like making profit off of what you do? Mm -hmm. Um, so I guess technically it was a while ago. It was, I, I guess it would have been about 10 years ago or so. Um, not long after I finished doing my, um, schooling for 3D and film production. Um, it started, it kind of dipped very briefly into freelancing, um, and at that point, I was, like, super undercharging. It was just, like, nah. <laughs> it was not good at all. Like, I remember doing this one job where I basically had to, like, reformat a um, hundred, like, was it? Uh, it was, like, hundreds of um, comic panels from rectangles into squares. And I was, yeah, like, the amount of, it was just so much work. And I think I made, like, I don't know, a few dollars per, per panel. <laughs> so oh, no. it was, like, so work it was just weeks of me working so yeah that was like my first foray into that and I was just not not good at charging um, at all what uh, what I should have been for the amount of work I was doing um so after a bit I kind of transitioned away from that into like unrelated freelance work um uh, and then recently just a couple years ago I decided oh I'll try freelancing again professionally and so it was around that time that I was starting to get more um yeah um commissions and more commercial work from varying sources and yeah since then i've kind of been focused on building up my freelance career that way <laughs> um yeah yeah so yeah, i'll say yeah it would be like the last two or three years is basically when i started making a more livable amount <laughs> <laughs> awesome mia I first started selling my work in galleries, so that was like a year out of art school, like 2008 um, till like 2012, but I had no idea what I was doing, <laughs> so I would just like paint, you know, and just whatever sold, sold, and I, but I didn't have like any kind of strategy or any kind of, I don't know, there's people, there's artists that I know that have like a five-year plan or like a 10-year plan, you know, I didn't have any of that, uh, I was just kind of going off the cuff, and, um, and yeah, I just, uh, I actually had a sort of five year gap there where I wasn't really selling much work. So I started selling stuff again in 2017 when I started exhibiting at conventions. Um, and I did that till 2019. And I was actually going to take a break in 2020 to write my book and the pandemic happened. Um, so I've been selling my work online as well. I've had a Patreon for the last three years. Uh, so it's kind of been a combination of all those things. And I recently started doing freelance illustration as well. 
I did one job back in, I think, 2009. And then my second freelance job was last year. So it's been all over the map. Um, but uh, full disclosure, I've not, I've not made like 30K a year with my art ever in my career. <laughs> so um, <laughs> I've had to find other ways to make an income. And that's, you know, that's, that's fine with me. And um, because I, this is the only way I kind of know how to make art and I'm really passionate about it. So um, I just decided, you know what, I'd rather actually work non-creative jobs like waiting tables and stuff and get to just, you know, do the kind of art I love and figure that out at my own pace, then uh, then try to force myself maybe to do something that, I don't know, I don't know what it would do, but um, but basically that's just been my, my solution, I suppose, is just to find other work to supplement my income while I figure out what I'm doing, so yeah. Yeah, I think that's really important to, to like know that there's other, there's other means that you can, you know, use to make income rather than, it, it doesn't have to be all in one thing, you're, you're all of your eggs don't have to be in one basket. So yeah. I totally get that. Eric, I believe you're the last five minutes. Um, <clears throat> I started making, uh, I started working professionally as a, as an illustrator and painter uh, the day after I graduated from from school so this is a uh, it's flashback to the year 2000 when lycos was an email account and, <laughs> oh my god lycos <laughs> and everybody had netscape and wow. google wasn't even a word <laughs> yeah the, oh, the the olden days right the olden days wow. oh my god. Um, i'm your age my guy <laughs> <laughs> I need to roast him like that. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> <Let him win>. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever, Brie, my knees work, so. Came out your neck. Wow. <laughs> Oh my goodness. <laughs> um, I'm not sure yeah, how pirates booty with you is mine. <laughs> no, it was uh it was you know it was good. Um I ended up working for uh, a fine artist in New York City uh painting murals. Um uh like he would photo collage it and we would project it and we would paint the murals and he would sign his name and make a million dollars and we got our hourly rate. <laughs> so that was wow. my, that was my first job. Um, I felt sick inside when I found out how much he was selling these things for, and he never picked up a brush, not once, not once. Oh my goodness. So, yeah. But uh, that, that was my first, my first gig. And then um, like, I think I was steadily working as an illustrator uh in animation and other things like that probably a good it took about a good three or four years out of school uh before i felt like i had made it i guess you know there's like you, you see you see people you you go to school with and they're like rock stars or something like they're they're instantly getting jobs working for big studios or something like that and like I'm, I'm at home, you know, <laughs> like, like, why, why is that me? Like, what am I doing wrong? But uh, like, everybody's got, everybody hits their, every, it's, you know, everybody finds their time, finds their moment mm -hmm. uh, at different points. So uh, like, like with me, uh, you know, it's probably a good thing that you don't just randomly apply for random art job number 12 and hate it yeah. and then get accustomed to a lifestyle and not be able to escape it because you know you won't be able to find something that pays what it pays and be and, you know be happy yeah you know so <laughs> yeah i've stayed hungry and i've kept my relationship with my art and that's kind of the reason why i did it this way it might sound insane but that that's literally been the reason <laughs> so yep it's not insane at all i think that's very reasonable actually <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because for me, I started um, I started selling my art. Also, very similar to you, Kristen, um, where I would sell it in middle school uh, because I was an introvert and didn't really want to talk to people, but I wanted to talk to people. 
And so I would draw to get them to come over to me. And then they, they decided that it had value. And I was like, oh, that's cool. Like, I'll just like, I put little prices in the corner of my sketchbook and would say like, hey, you can buy this for $3. And I would get enough money to buy a bunch of snacks at the end of the day and um, have my little dragon hoard going of chocolate. So yeah, it was a pretty good, yeah. it was a pretty <laughs> good uh, setup. Because I still was just drawing whatever I wanted, but people decided they wanted to purchase it. So it was great. Um, so uh, I had done a few small freelance jobs, like when I was in high school, like for graphic design stuff. But um, when I got, uh, it really started when I got out of college. And obviously I, I started my career in animation, but uh, I also started to do conventions. And I, I went to conventions in like 2003, like back when I was 16 years old and I just aged myself. But um, <laughs> <laughs> now you know how old I am. But I was never confident enough to think that I could ever be there with those artists. And then the year I graduated SCAD, one of my friends was saying that they had a table and there was supposed, they were supposed to share with somebody and they dropped out of it. And they needed somebody to take over. And they're like, hey, can you take over like for me so you can sell your work at this table? And I'm like, uh, uh, sure. And so within a month, I created an entire backlog of merch and made bookmarks myself and made buttons myself and, um, you know, sold like, you know, made whatever prints I had lying around. And that was my first con experience. I made like $500. It was like nothing, but I was so excited about it. And because like, there was nothing more satisfying than people handing you money for things that you were going to make anyway. So it felt really cool. But as I've gotten older, my relationship with, with art has soured a little bit because so much of my life has been spent chasing that profit because of student loans and desperation and trying to pay them off and getting extra income so I can survive. And um, it's just kind of been rolling from there. So um, I really, um, I really want to go into like, when you're in a situation like that, when you're really like, like, you know, trying to make ends meet and trying to make money, um, do you feel like you've kept your own voice when you've been making your art? Or do you feel like, something might have gotten lost in the way or do you have to keep the two things separate is the art that you make for yourself not the art that you make for profit can i answer this hmm can i answer this yeah oh my gosh when i was in when, before, before i graduated i might have told this story before because i used to talk about it all the time but before i graduated i had a, an okay but it was a decent portfolio it was a great portfolio for a graduating student but for a professional i still need a lot of work but I was really proud of what I'd done. And I had this teacher who had been an industry professional for several centuries. And I was showing her my portfolio because I was really like, I really looked up to her and I thought she was really great. Um, and she told me to take, I had a, um, um, an indigenous Rapunzel in my portfolio, like a whole story based around her. It was a queer story and everything. And she told me to take it out because I was black and I didn't need any more black characters in my portfolio. Wow. What? I might have told that to you guys before. Oh, you gotta know. tell that. You gotta, you, gotta slow, you gotta slow down and tell that story right. <laughs> keeping it in my portfolio. It stayed in my portfolio with the first job that I got at Netflix. It stayed in my portfolio with my Spider-Verse jobs. It has stayed. I mean, I don't think it's in there anymore. It might be, it might still be in there because it's, it's a cute story. But like, screw that, you know, my voice is my voice. You can't, you can't tell me what to put in my portfolio or dictate, you know, how I tell my stories or design or showcase my characters so long as they're you know to a certain level of like showing that I can you know do the job professionally and this that and the other thing everything else is up to me you know? absolutely that's crazy though like yeah. I've, no, I've never heard that story before oh, you know, well, there you go. I don't know about you guys but I can relate to Bree's story because I at some point I feel like I don't know if you've all had this experience or not, but there's somebody in your life that tells you that you shouldn't do something. Mm -hmm. You need to not go this way, don't go that way. Why are yeah. you painting black people? Why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? There's no money in that. There's like somebody that's discouraging enough. They get in your head and you go, what? You know what? They, they might be right. And that 
can throw off years of your life. Mm -hmm. Years. I mean, to 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 Bree's credit, she, you know, she's a rock star, you know. <laughs> <laughs> with, with or without that piece. But man, like who knows? You could be on like book five of uh, a whole series right now. Mm -hmm. Had that person said, keep it in there. That's awesome. That's completely different from every other portfolio any any studio will ever see. Right. That's right. That's so messed up. Insanity. Yeah. Uh, Gosh. It's right. frustrating. <laughs> yeah. I mean, working working for a big company definitely has, it has its perks, obviously. Like, you don't have to worry about insurance. Like, you can, you know, you know that your like income is going to be stable no matter what but also you're using a lot of your creative energy to put into um you know somebody else's vision essentially and then when you get out of work how much creative energy do you have left over and that's like mm -hmm. always been the struggle with me is just like i feel sometimes i feel so exhausted after work because i've used so much brain power to focus on um you know like my job and then afterwards i'm just like okay i want to draw now it's time to illustrate and I'm like, I can't, I can't, <laughs> I just yeah. say I can't sometimes, but yeah, so, I mean, sometimes it's just, it's just tricky to, to balance those things. And like part of that too was why I started doing, I, I kept doing conventions after I started working full time and I started my Etsy store. Um, I started uh, doing a bunch of freelance stuff just because I felt like I really wanted to keep myself sharp as an artist doing the things that I still wanted to do, even though I was doing other art because I just didn't want to lose that part of myself. Uh, what that resulted in is a guarantee that I wouldn't get a day off. So <laughs> <laughs> I feel that. It was like a rolling 10 year burnout that I'm still in the midst of now. And so, um, you know, I'm trying to, to do better at balancing those two things because I'm really trying to maintain who I am as an artist and also like who I am as a professional, you know, person in a studio. Because uh, I, I really do like both realms. I like all the people that I meet and I like the things that I work on. But at the same time, I love doing my own art. And I love have, like seeing my own vision through. So it's just, it's a struggle sometimes. But yeah. yeah definitely but, cool. um, <laughs> where, were, where were we in the, in the order of the story? I think we were just telling stories. We were reading Bree's Professor. We were, <laughs> we were reading Bree's <laughs> Professor for Bill. Oh my God. Really? Did That's I miss really out? Cool. But oh, you blipped out, yeah. No. Oh no. <laughs> but I mean, like that's like you know, there so many people do hear that kind of thing though, where they they're told that their own vision is not valid yeah. when it absolutely is, and it could just be because people haven't really seen that before and people haven't experienced it. So I think it's coming from a place of they're trying to protect you, but they're also remaining with tradition because they yeah. think that this thing is not going to sell this this thing is not going to go anywhere so it's a very narrow mindset and then it creates this cyclical like toxic cycle where it's just like oh well we haven't seen it be successful mm -hmm. and therefore it's not successful and therefore, therefore you it's shouldn't not. even try yeah it's, it's yeah. guaranteeing then, that we'll never see something like that become successful exactly and that's what puts so much pressure on projects that are different more mm -hmm. diverse you know telling stories that we're not used to that's that's the reason why there's this unspoken pressure of these projects to have to knock it out of the park and have to be the best of the best of the best when we have seen the same like if we can be honest we have seen the same story being told over and over again honestly <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and those things keep getting funded, and it's just yeah. like if you, you know, some. And I'm not saying like, oh, well, we, we should champion mediocre work, but I'm just saying let's level the playing field. If we can have work out there that's a similar story, if you're trying something different, then you need to be comfortable with the. And it's not even a risk, and I hate that framing of it too. It's not mm -hmm. even a risk. We sh not we, but the powers that be should become more comfortable with thinking outside of the, the box and and investing in stories and in creators especially and I want to highlight that in creators who are from a different walk of life and are championing a different uh, demographic than they're they're used to because once yeah. we start championing championing those creators then we're that's when we're going to start to see change and that's when we're going to see like the full spectrum of what storytelling is really capable of Absolutely. You can't just anyway, I can get it. hot about this every time. 
<laughs> I, but you, you there's also the issue of like we we are in an industry that likes to say things instead of actually taking the steps and the very minimal effort in my opinion to actually do things yeah that can be really frustrating too yeah it's i mean they the corporations find it scary to take risks because they think i mean there's a monetary cost associated with taking a risk but it's so worth it as well to see when you take a risk that pays off because then that changes the landscape completely i mean we've seen it with spider-verse we've seen it with black panther like we've seen right. that these stories that come from different places can actually do well because there is an appetite for that people are tired of seeing the same thing over and over again and so yeah. when an artist has a unique voice and a vision that's the most valuable thing you could champion because it's going to change what is available and the kind of content that we all can consume and it gives something for everybody too it's like because this entire landscape has been catered to mainly one type of audience and now that's starting to change and i think it's it's slow but it's beautiful to start seeing some of that change actually happen and it takes artists you know a, diver a diverse set of artists like this for example to really start to pioneer that change and to start really making that happen so Mm -hmm. um yeah. you know like i, I want to know from from all of you it's like you know if you also have stories of people trying to tamp down that change or if you have success of your own unique voice actually making some kind of difference i'm curious yeah. about that. i guess it's not uh, I'm fortunate that i've had people support like what i want to do um consistently throughout my life so that's always been like a huge privilege to have like family and whatnot that haven't ever told me that I couldn't do something that I wanted to do. Um, but one thing I feel like I've noticed, and I don't know if this is the case for a lot of you too, <laughs> but like having a portfolio where I'm like, I have a very specific interest and focus. Like I'm trying to try to create uplifting images of us and like, you know, in a world that doesn't wish to. Uh, and I feel like <laughs> so often it ends up being a block in a weird way because companies come by my page they see what i'm making and then they kind of put it in this box of like oh yeah we'll be back during black history month <laughs> you know when yeah. we need to draw black people mm -hmm. um or you know it's like only ever and i i feel like i'm not ever considered for a wider no not ever but i'm rarely considered for a wider spectrum of work than that because they see me drawing a specific thing and then they're like, well, I guess you can't draw anything else. You can't draw the, you know, like varying races of people, I assume. But then the reverse isn't true because I see artists who do not have any diversity in their portfolios whatsoever, who are skilled and they're able to like infer from that, obviously that they can draw a wider range of things. <laughs> um, and so I feel like, I'm not sure if that's a thing other people, have, if you, any of you have noticed this as well, but it's something that's bothered me for quite a while, where I almost feel like I have to compromise my focus in order to get more work. <laughs> because also the projects that are being made do not often feature black people because they're not willing to diversify in the first place. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's something that I've been feeling since I started freelancing. Yeah, it's like almost like people are typecasting you into just like one kind of art role, but that is not, like it was absolutely not true. Because like, yeah, people who don't have diverse portfolios do not have to deal with that kind of limitation. So right. definitely that double standard there for sure. <laughs> yes, I feel like okay. it's the case. <laughs> yeah, it's frustrating. It's frustrating because if you're a skilled artist, you can draw anything. <laughs> you're right. definitely able to draw it and like, you know they should just look at your style and be like that's just amazing we want those colors we want this comp we want this composition sense but and, and not it's, what right and it's not even like i'm asking like okay to look at my portfolio where i'm fo character focused and like assume i can draw max because no i don't draw max but i'm like i'm drawing black people and so therefore they're like well you can't draw white people or you can't draw asian people or you can't well, i don't know if it's yeah, i don't yeah, know if it's i'm know. sorry but i don't know if it's and this is just me talking, but I don't know if it's as much a a, a concern that you don't want to, or mm. not not that you not that you can't, but that you might not want to. Interesting. Okay. So, so then I wonder why the opposite doesn't seem to be. Uh, well, I mean, because the opposite is the default, mm -hmm. and if you're good at painting the default, nobody questions whether or not you can paint other. Right. But if you're painting other non-stop and your whole portfolio your whole instagram your whole whatever is full of other 
they're not going to wonder whether or not you have any interest in painting the default. They're just going to say, well, I guess they don't want to, so let's move on. Mm. Yeah, that's an interesting, it makes sense. It's yeah, a frustrating flip though, but I understand, yeah, I see what you're, I understand your point for sure. That does make total sense. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, yeah, uh, frustrating. Right? <laughs> and it stands out to them way more than the, the default does because when you, when they look at default art, they don't give a second thought to it. But when they see other, they're like, oh, instead of just like, oh, that's a really cool character portrait. They're like, oh, that's a cool black character portrait. There's a, right. there's a picture yeah. that comes in front of it which is unfortunate. And that's something that I really want to try to change as much as I can. Uh, hmm, just because, like, yeah. The more people are exposed to it, the less they're going to start to assume that we're not capable of doing anything else because this is just a person that exists in the world or doesn't exist in the world. It's just another world and it's fine. Like, it just yeah. it doesn't matter if like what, you know, what race they are. They, the, the merit of the artist is still behind it. And that's what matters the most. But it's, it's going to take a while for that to change, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. What about you, Kristen? How have people received your work? Um, it's, it's been interesting because I, in many ways, I feel like I got a late start when it comes to having a career in um, design in animation. Mm -hmm. And I, I always just painted what I wanted um, and, and had a great time for it, but I wasn't, and then I was at all these conventions and that's the funny thing, like I was at all these conventions, I was showing up and I was receiving some rec recognition, but it hasn't been until the last, I would say like couple of years where people are seeing those same paintings and like really responding to it. <laughs> <laughs> and some of that work is like five, six years old. <laughs> it's kind of like, and not to say like, oh, all old art is bad. You know, your art still has value, um, period. But it's just, it's been interesting to observe and, and I don't know if I, I, yeah, I, I don't know why it's res resonating with people right now. And in many ways, I, I just feel happy to be here, but in other, in other ways, like there's a part of me that's still kind of like, well, is this, is this time going to run out? You hmm. know, am I, am I not going to be in vogue? In the, in the next couple of years and, and what then, especially when we're talking about being typecast and, and only um, being approached if it's for uh, work that features like black people, right? Or whatever marginalized group you come from, right? Like if, if that's the, the continuing trend and if that falls out of favor does that mean that I'm out of the loop? Like sometimes I get scared about that. So mm -hmm. yeah. A part, and a part of me is just like, well, if your work is good, it's good. And another part of me is just like, that's it. Am I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I want to be positive and just feel like I have faith in my work and that's going to carry me through. And then another part of me, yeah, just still, still has that fear. It's that, that voice in your head that always tells you like, you don't deserve anything. And, Oh no. You're gonna be out on the street soon. <laughs> Is that imposter syndrome, Kristen? Absolutely. Yeah. No, it's it's a rampant. <laughs> That's what it sounds like. But yeah. but it's true. But I can yeah. I can I can relate to that so hard because I've been going through that same thing where all of a sudden people are really interested in what I have to make and companies have been reaching out to me. Like I got hit up by Lucasfilm and like what? In, Blizzard before and like, yeah like it'd be cool if you could come over here and I'm like well I'm not looking but this is awesome what's going on and then I can't it's I'm not putting it on them but I can't help but think sometimes like are these companies only reaching out to me because it's in vogue right now to hire diverse talent like is it only because I have been outspoken about it and have you know the show about it and have been appearing in articles about stuff like this and will that favor go away once we're not trending anymore and it's it's I think it's a valid fear to have because we weren't trending before and mm -hmm. we weren't getting that same kind of response so it's just like is this only because y'all are thinking about it and once you think about something else are you going to forget about us and so that's what I'm afraid of um as well but 
currently the work that I've been doing has been getting a great response, like better than I, I could have ever even imagined. Um, I mean, I talked about Gen Con a lot, but Gen Con was really like the first convention where the response was really, really positive. Just because like, you know, not just because of who I am, obviously the work that I made had value too, but there were a lot of people commenting. They're just like, it's so nice to see like, you know, like a black artist actually doing these things or like drawing diverse people. And it was very genuine. Um, and so I'm hoping that that doesn't go away. I'm hoping that with the people who have been caught in this wave of understanding that there's more that needs to be recognized in this world than just the default, um, I'm hoping that that wave permanently captures more people. And I think it definitely has. So if you want to be optimistic about it, I think that's my optimistic takeaway from all that. <laughs> yeah, no, I love that. That's a good take. Yeah. Mia, what about you? Um, I don't know. I've sort of given up trying to predict people's minds about what they think about my work because it's just been so all over the place, like all my career. So, um, and, and it's just, I don't know, I guess like back in the gallery world, like if I tried to see, oh, which painting sold and which ones didn't, it, it there's there was just no really like logic to it, you know, and it's, and honestly, that wasn't how I wanted to to create was by seeing what sold and seeing or seeing what got the most likes or seeing what got me follows because rarely does that line up with what I actually uh you know love the most you know it's like and and part of me is just like if I could have a survey where my followers told me what they loved most about my work I almost wouldn't want to know because I'd be afraid that then I'd want to just keep doing that yeah. <laughs> or just, or that I'd know that if I did something else then I would automatically uh, you know, just expect a worse response, if that makes any sense. So I just try to stay away from, from that a bit. And just, um, like I said, since I, ever since I disconnected sort of my income from my art, I, I've just had a different mindset about it maybe. Um, and it's just a personal choice, I guess, because I just didn't want that pressure. Cause I have just so much anxiety of just about life in general. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I mean, I, at conventions, it was, I, I don't, I, I remember anytime I was excited, like, oh, that seems like a good number. There was always like artists out there that made like 10 times more money, you know? So it's just like, it's, you can always find people who are, are making more, doing more than you. But I think it's just, for me, it's just been more of a, of a practice of like, if, if I'm still loving what I'm doing, that I'm on the right path, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and hoping that even if, even if I don't have a big enough audience that I could do this full time. I mean, I hope so. That's what I'd want. But even if I can't, I still will, would be okay with it because I love what I'm doing. You know, um, if that makes, I don't know if I'm answering your question at all, but. Um, no, that's, that's a great answer to the question. Yeah, because um, it's really easy to compare yourself to other people's successes, but I think the much more productive way to go about it is to, I mean, it's just, it's beating your own personal best. And if you beat your own personal best, then you've made progress and that's what matters. And that's what I, that's how I had to frame things for myself because it's really easy to look at other people's followers, look at other people's profits and be like, man, like I didn't really get uh, like that kind of, I can't make those kinds of numbers. What am I doing? Like, why can't I make those numbers? But then I look at all my previous posts or all my previous conventions and I'm like, but this was so much better than what I did before. And like, you're mm -hmm. growing, you're growing in some way. And I mm -hmm. think it's very special. Um, was there anybody who hasn't been able to answer that question? I just want to make sure I got everybody. What exactly was the question again? You know? <laughs> <laughs> it was a question that kind of it just became a conversation, which I'm, which I'm down with. So I'm just going to move on. How about that? <laughs> I, but I, also, but I also do want to know, in pursuit of making money, do you feel like your art has changed because you've been trying to make money from it like has it actually transformed your art or do you think you've been able to maintain your own voice throughout your entire journey Ooh. um i've pretty much been able to maintain my my voice um but i mean it wasn't it's it's kind of like on the surface there's nothing deep or you know uh no deep symbolism to anything i do i just like sci-fi so um Anytime somebody gives me opportunity to do that, I don't care who the company is. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just gonna, I, my whole thing is just to nail it. Um, <clears throat> but uh, going back to what uh, Kristen was talking about, like that fear, that, that concern about 
whether or not the work that we get is going to run out when we're not in, in fashion anymore. Um, it's something I think about, uh, but it's, I also try to make a conscious effort to have as much of the default in my portfolio as possible. And just to let companies know that like I was out here doing the default way before I started painting other, because that's what you wanted to see. So don't come at me and say, well, I guess you don't want to paint what we do because we don't see you doing it now. You know, I've been around a long, a long enough to have different styles, different types of work uh, out there and in my portfolio. So um, I think I like the I like the hope that as long as we're producing quality content and delivering it on time and, you know, are just cool to work with that stuff's not going to die out, but, you know, who knows? I mean, we could go full on Mad Max in the next two years, you know, so yeah. I, I have an art where art's going to go the way of the dodo. So who knows? You know, and, and that's, that's a really good point. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, sorry. Oh. No, you go. You. <laughs> oh, I was just going to say um, to what Eric was saying about um, the default. The, that's something that I've been stubborn on <laughs> for like a long time. And I have started like recently, like the last year or so, like loosening my groove on that. Because a lot of that has felt like, oh, but I don't want to like... I'm focused on spending all the time that I have to create this very specific vision that I'm trying to share. But the reality of living is also that, you know, um, as far as like making income goes, as far as like the profit side of things, there are, there's more of one type of work than there is of others. And so it's been something that I've been kind of feeling conflict about, like, am I compromising like something by like expanding into that and like spending more of my time, adding more of that into my portfolio? But as I've been talking to more people about that, it's becoming clear to me that, you know, it doesn't, it's not that deep, <laughs> but, but also um, it's like, it's a, yeah, it's something I have to split from one from the other one, um, I guess, in terms of personal work versus commercial work. But yeah. And Kristen, what were you going to say? Oh, um, I think. I lost it. <laughs> oh no, no sorry. Oh, no. No, you're good. You're good. Um, but, but I'll piggyback off of what you were saying, Edge, about, um, about portfolios. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to go at it at, from the lens of like environments and props because I avoided those, like the plague, when I was first starting out. <laughs> I just did not want to draw that stuff. Um, but I found that the most work that was available at the time was for prop designers and background designers. So being able to separate like, okay, this is what I need for my portfolio in order to prove that I can do the job versus what I do for my personal work, like being able to separate that like has helped tremendously. So there are things in my portfolio that like I don't consider my baby because <laughs> it's not my baby, right? Yeah. I'm doing it so I can get work and I can pay my bills. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in a, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, sorry. I can ramble about this. You can go. <laughs> I can say in a, in a weird turn or like flip side to that, for me, my portfolio is catered to whatever it is that I want to draw at that moment it's not really for any particular studio it's just for whatever project likes the style or likes whatever and and it's mostly i look at it now and it's it, it's so in hindsight because i'm a costume designer now so in hindsight i'm like oh crap that's exactly what i was leaning towards but like when i first graduated you know i had recruiters telling me to do more environments do more cinematic moments do more this do more that and you know doing those things still didn't get me work you know so it's like you know what if i'm not gonna get work i'm gonna <laughs> not get work drawing what i love and drawing what like <laughs> really hyper speaks to me and the what i'm scared of and i think this is something that i'll continue to be scared of for 
several years is being a costume designer in animation. We're so niche and so tiny. Maybe no four other people, one at Skydance, two over at Disney and another at Netflix, I think. And, and I'm sure there's more, but that's how small we are, you know? Like I can name 10 character designers off my hands, but it's so hard to really name costume designers. And it's my fear is that this niche that I have carved out for myself will only take me but so far until I have to go back to character design, which is wild to say since character design is like the most sought out position. Mm-hmm. It's crazy, but I don't want to go back to it. I'm super happy as a costume designer. So it's very interesting that that's my biggest fear. You know, my, it's, it's not, you know, not getting hired because I'm drawing so, so many of the other and not so many of the other other (laughs) but like it's more of my costume fear what have i done to myself (laughs) yeah i think to that point though you can't really predict where your career is gonna go you know and it's like it's such a we're all hoping to be doing this but while we're eight when we're 80 you know hopefully and Mm -hmm. the people who can keep can keep the same discipline for that long i I think that that's a that's sort of the thing of the past right the people that worked at disney for 30 years you know i mean there's nothing wrong with sort of evolving with your career if that's where it takes you as long as you get to do art and you get to do what you love I think that's awesome but I I I understand that it's if that's what you want to do and to watch it like it must have been like that for the book cover illustrators in the 70s when they had all the jobs and then all of a sudden photography takes over and these like literally celebrity illustrators like no longer have jobs um right and, right and so I don't I don't want to become that you know so it's like I'm willing to pivot and and I have in my career you know in, in terms of everything I've done but it's just something that came to mind when you were saying that that it's just that we have no control over it and like what Eric was saying too that it could be the apocalypse tomorrow <laughs> because we couldn't even predict it would be a pandemic now so right. it kind of is no point in worrying about the future even though I do it every day so yeah <laughs> I know it's right now. worrying about it, right? Because uh-huh. it gives you, because it, it's like if I, if I can predict the worst things that'll ever happen, then it, in some ways I'm seeing it coming. Yeah. So in yeah. some ways it's like a comfort because I've already predicted it. So if it does happen, it's like, see, I told you. You know, it's that weird. It's this weird. It, it's not. And <laughs> <laughs> I never said it was logical. But <laughs> that's the way to go about it. But I do, I do agree that. Uh, since we can't predict the future, we should just do what we like. And I also think it's really important to, to, to not put all of your hopes and dreams on, on work, you know, right. whether it's a studio gig, whether it's a freelance gig. Yeah. Right. I remember when I was in school, um, Professor Troy Gustafson, oh, he told cool. me like, first up, he was just like, you need to get a hobby like other than art <laughs> once, oh. once you graduate. And at the time I was like, but drawing's my hobby. That's all I need, you know? And, but it's true. It's, it's, it's taking the time to, uh, when you don't put so much pressure on your happiness to also be your source of income, like if that happens, that's amazing. But it, if you allow yourself to have that side project, to have your personal work outside of uh, whatever, like, because if, if you're not the art director, if you're not the executive on your show, you only have so much power, right? So, so sticking to a project that you have 100% control over, I think, like, like Mia was talking about, it's just gonna make you so much more uh, fulfilled in the long run. Just as long as you don't burn out trying to do both. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what, I think that's the key too. Don't burn out trying to do. Don't burn that, out. That whole thing. Don't burn out. Period. That's <laughs> the hardest thing to do is not burn out. It's so difficult. It's so easy to burn out. really all. Yeah. Being oh burnout without even knowing you're in burnout. It's, yes. it's, it's it's really real. If anybody watching this is dealing with burnout, go ahead and uh, just pop on the episode of Painted in Color that talks all about burnout. I think that we were all burnt out in different degrees when we recorded that episode <laughs> and it was really real. So um, yeah, it's like impossible to tell an artist to not burn out because like it's just guaranteed, unfortunately. And it shouldn't be guaranteed at night, but that's like, that's what we've been set up for is to yeah. glorify this working habit of staying up forever and not going to sleep and just dedicating all of your waking hours to art. And you can't do that. You can't, it's so not healthy to do that. 
you have to you have to find other things to look at. You you do have to go outside and touch grass at one point or another. It's very important to to get out and experience life as well because you know art is just one facet of our lives, but it's not it doesn't have to be everything. Um, and it's the thing that makes us happy. But again, there should be other things that make you happy too. Like you can't limit it to one thing. Because like, what do you do if it goes away? What if you do if, um, you know, Lord forbid you break your arm or something like that. You gotta do something else in that time that you're recovering. So what you gonna do? Like, how are you gonna be happy when you do that? So you really have to think of, um, you know, what else is important to you aside from just art. It's, it's really, it's good to keep those two things um, separate from each other. But, um, but going back to that, portfolio conversation for me um the art that I have made in my portfolio has not necessarily been to cater to any one given studio just because I, I honestly just didn't know how <laughs> mm -hmm. and so I just kept rolling and people would see um the style and everything and they'd be like I think you can do this that's usually how it ended up I was like I, just, I think you can do it and then I would do the art test and be like yeah you can do it <laughs> and then I got hired, which was pretty cool. But um, the way I've gotten around it for myself, uh, you know, having to force myself to cater my art to one specific thing is to, I just became a manager and now I don't have to make art anymore. <laughs> I just have an eye for what good art looks like and tell other people how to do it. And then I have all that creative energy <laughs> left over <laughs> so I can do my own art. There we go. I fixed it. I broke the system. Then you can't <laughs> That's the key right there. Just become an art director and then you don't have to worry. Become an art director. Um, there you go. Exactly. New goals. 2022. Love, yeah, I love art directing. It's a lot of fun. Um, mm. Because Mostly like you, really, you get to control the vision, but like you don't have to be on the hook to deliver all the things. And it mm. takes a lot of the pressure off, but there's a lot of pressure on because you have a lot of responsibility in that situation too. So it is not a cakewalk. It is still very stressful. But no, it's the easiest thing in the world. It's, yeah, no, it's, it's the easiest the thing in the world. <laughs> <laughs> well, also, like, that worry, too, of, like, will another company have me for my art style? I'm just, it's, it, it kind of dissipates because now that I'm a manager, I'm looked at for what I can manage rather than what I can create. And that takes a lot of the pressure off of the art that I actually have to provide companies in my portfolio, too. Obviously, it still needs to be a solid portfolio. It needs to demonstrate an understanding of art and all the concepts and all the principles. But whether or not I can do the art in the style of a company is a little bit less of an importance. And so that, you know, that's my, my secret method. It, it was not intentional. None of this was intentional. This was not planned. You <laughs> know what's so funny mental. about the whole art style to a piece of company kind of thing? You really don't. Don't like, do. Don't do that. Don't do that. Here's the thing. If a studio wanted to hire someone who could work in Adventure Time or Steven Universe or whatever, they'll just hire those people again because they know that style at the back of their hand. Yep. You, know? you know, my thing is when it comes to like styles and portfolios or whatever, don't worry about whether a studio not's going to pick up your, your work or you as a person because you're your your how your personal house style doesn't match what has or hasn't been done at a studio studio yet. Don't even worry about that. On Spider-Verse, you know, the character team, we all drew so differently, mm. vastly differently from one another. On Steps at Netflix, Tenna, Amanda, and I, we draw vastly different than one another. But we get the job done. That's all that matters is can you get the job done? I mean, obviously, sure, if you're working for prime time, that's different. You definitely have to work in that style. If, you know, if you're further wrong in pre-production, Sure, you know, there's obviously different reasons for different things, but like that shouldn't be your main focus is to make sure you can draw Disney way or make sure you can draw Pixar or whatever. Draw like you. Yeah. So draw like you. Uh, pause real you. quick. Um, Brie, has Steps been announced yet? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Brie's just like, can we talk about this? Like, I was just like, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, good. I was just checking. Okay. <laughs> it was, what was it announced? Yesterday? No, I'm kidding. Uh, like, <laughs> like two months ago? Yeah. What okay, is good. Steps? Yeah, I want to know all about this now. It's a movie! It's a beautiful movie. For, for what, for what, uh, what, what company? Obviously. Netflix? Yeah. Obviously. Oh. Okay. Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't, but then again, I don't, I haven't. I haven't, I don't know what's going on in the world. Oh, Eric, anymore. no! 
<laughs> this is what I mean. You have to break out of the basement and experience things. Yeah. <laughs> like out go outside and be like, oh, it's, it's, it's so bright. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> oh, please. It's, it's like so to good. Kristen's point, you need a hobby. You need a hobby. Yeah. yeah. I had a hobby. I had a hobby. Oh, no. Guys, I lost my layer. I had one of those long, long, <laughs> long, long time ago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I haven't been happy with anything that I've drawn today. Like it's oh yeah, same. Like, this is all bullshit. It's no, and that's the thing too. Sometimes it's okay to bullshit. Like so, like yeah. right. Like sometimes, why does everything that we create have to be you know industry ready or or online oh, ready? Yeah. You know, like sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes you're gonna draw something shitty, and that's okay. <laughs> we're gonna draw my shitty couples. Yeah, it's just be free. We, you know? Sometimes we can't draw amazing on demand. You're absolutely right, Kristen. Thank you for that that extra dose of validation. Because I was literally, it's so funny. Cause I tell people that all the time. I'm like, yeah, like you don't have to put pressure on yourself like that. Mm. But except for me, it's only it's <laughs> exactly. like, oh, all of you are, are all of you are good. But me, I have to perform all. <laughs> no, stop oh, that. Uh, I bailed out on mine after 10 strokes because it wasn't awesome. So, <laughs> no. so like, I'm just watching this and admiring how each of you has such a unique way of, of building up your pieces and like mm -hmm. seeing Kristen go from that gesture drawing that just the whole build up. And I like, God, Mia's probably done like 15 heads and like, I know. <laughs> Mia, like I, every, every time I look up, it's amazing. a different head. I'm like, oh my God. Yeah, and Brie, your gestures of your bodies are so wonderful. Yeah. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm failing miserably. And Edge, Edge, you already know. Like you, you already know. <laughs> I already gassed you up. Right. <laughs> is is Brie holding herself back because this is like a PG thirteen audience or something? I actually am. There might uh, be I... minors watching this, so we got to. There might be minors. <laughs> yeah. This is really cute, though. I'm loving it. I love your line work, honestly. It's like yeah, it's yeah. So but um, gorgeous. oh, I think the original question was if your art has actually changed based on um monetization. And Eric, now that you're back, it's it was interesting because when you were talking about um the fact that you do have the default in your portfolio, I wanted to know from you was that something that you would have still done if money was no object? No. Mm. Mm. No. I, 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 I made default my thing in my portfolio for the first 15, 20 years, almost 15 years of my career, because I remember a graphic design student at SVA, like peeking over my shoulder going, there ain't no black people in sci-fi. What are you doing that for? Mm. I'll never forget that. And I was like, you know what? He's probably right. And then I go to the bookstore and I look at the shelves and I look at who the top Hugo award winning, Chesley award winning guys are, they're all white artists. They're all painting white people having adventures. And I'm thinking, okay, well, if I want to work for all these different publishers, just like them, I got to show them that I can paint white people having adventures. And that was, <laughs> that was the portfolio. That was the career. And every single art student, no matter where they are in the world, they're taught to paint the default. Mm -hmm. when yeah. they teach you in art yeah. school how to how to paint flesh tones they're not teaching you how to paint the flesh tones of you or me yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, that's not it that's why i don't paint that's flesh cool. tones anymore <laughs> right but they're that's... purple and red and beautiful there you go flesh there tone. you go you know but True. that was that that's how that was the training yeah. and um so having that having that in my portfolio, even today, like I, I just finished a, I'm on a series right now um, where like the first book in the series is a, is a white kid like front and center, uh, like running toward camera. And I, I felt like I need to have this in my current middle grade book cover portfolio, just so that I can say to other publishers, see, I, I do, I can do more than just, <laughs> the black kid having adventures, even though I would like to do that, I'm mm. letting you know in advance. So don't come at me and say, well, I guess he doesn't want to do this. No, here it is. Mm. Right. On sale, October, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> right. So, um, but if, if money were no object, 
I would be <sighs> sitting home painting like some grand space opera paintings, <gasps> you know. Oh. We're, we're being deprived. Like, <laughs> I'm from Eric's space opera. a shame. Like the, the piece that so I started cool. with that, the, the Oba piece with the, the bald woman, mm -hmm. that was part of that vision. Like, okay, well, I want to do a whole series along that line. And I kind of feel like all of these freaking companies that want me to do work for them they're holding me back yeah. <laughs> they're giving you I feel like I feel like anakin like countries. having a temper tantrum they're holding me back <laughs> <laughs> i don't like sand <laughs> and it's all <laughs> oh my god <laughs> it's so coarse it gets everywhere it's people Amazing. they won't leave me alone they just want these <laughs> yeah but uh, yeah, if money were no object, that's a great question because I ask students that. Mm -hmm. um, that's a very Taoist uh, uh, way of uh, of thinking. Um, uh, what would you do with your life if money were no object? I ask students that. Yeah. And I know, I know we had that question on our show before, but we haven't mm -hmm. asked these guests. Yeah. 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 So, like, what did you guys, what did you guys say? I missed it. I'm sorry. No, it's all right. Yeah, we, we were kind of, like, talking. We were, I don't know if we explicitly answered the question. We were just talking about how we had catered our portfolios to, um, or didn't cater our portfolios to different companies. But, you yeah. know, like, I, I do want to know from each of all, from each of everybody, um, if, you know, if money were no object, would your art look different? No. Not a damn thing would change. Because right. people, people love me. <laughs> I don't know what it is. But people just like love me, and it's amazing. And I think I, I just I don't know how I got there. Awesome. I genuinely don't know what the hell happened. But it's like I'm gonna draw what I want. I'm gonna fill my Twitter with NSFW and I'm going to keep getting work because I'm good at what I do. I'm good at my job. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I, I, I work really hard. I work too hard not to be able to draw what the hell I want to draw. Yes. Yeah, that's how I see that's it. pretty much what I'm fighting with as well right now. Because it's for me, I'm almost like at the edge of like, do I do, do, I do the opposite? Because I've been doing that. My art wouldn't change because it's what I've been doing the whole time. Mm. Been, if anything, the last couple of years, I've really leaned even harder into exactly the sort of thing that I want to be making. Um, but then I'm starting to wonder, like, do mm -hmm. I... Do I want to fight this fight if I want to try to make art my career? So then the question is now, like, well, maybe I don't rely on art to make my income, or maybe I find other ways. I'm really hoping to like find ways of pivoting into more independent creation, for example, like you know, building other things, like maybe I don't know, creating products and stuff like that. But then again, it's like this whole like, it's putting so much weight on the art itself to in a world that doesn't want to compensate <laughs> appropriately for the amount of work and time it's taking i often wonder like maybe i just just pivot into something else and let the art be there so that's stuff that i've been thinking about for the last you know while <laughs> about because i tr i started fre freelancing to see because for the longest time i didn't want to focus on on it um but after some time it started to feel like you know what i need to try I, I want to try now and just see how i feel about it and i've tried it for the last couple of years and i'm kind of tired <laughs> of just like whole like the whole fight um yeah so it's just kind of where i'm at right now I'm trying to see like how i feel about it moving forward you know every every illustrator at some point stops and they move they find something else to do um, you know, there's the rock stars, the award winners, society of illustrators, blah, 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 people that might hang in there for a long time, but then even they go and teach, right? They're, they, they, because their cost of living changes, their, their, their ability to pull all nighters and deal with all the BS changes. They're like, you know what? This isn't worth my time anymore. I'm going to go teach. 
and uh, or I'm going to go do this. Or I'm going to do that. I'm going to like I one of my mentors in college was a romance cover illustrator for years and then bailed out and now paints murals. You know, gets six figures for painting one painting. Mm-hmm. Right. Like <laughs> you level up, you find something else to do with that's worth your time. So for you, it would just be, okay, well, if this isn't what you want to do, go find it and be happy Mm -hmm. because it's, life's too short to just be like, ah, I don't want to do this anymore, but I got to. I've been feeling Mm -hmm. that. Yeah. But like just even the last few weeks, because I realized I'm not living life like I'm 30 and I'm like, I've been cooped up in my room, just like fighting impossible deadlines for the longest time. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm just, I was just telling them earlier, just the, the yesterday <laughs> I crashed after having spent the previous 48 hours plus working straight to hit a deadline. I didn't sleep. So I was just like, I, I can't, I can't do it anymore. Like my body uh, can't take this. I'm not going, I'm not, you know, I'm not healthy anymore. I'm just, and my, my mental health is suffering too. Like in terms of just like the, it's just not, <laughs> ideal and i mean i could i'm sure i could keep going and like it's fine now in quotes <laughs> like as i could probably keep going and like get to a better place but it's not like first That's of all the fight it's not it doesn't yeah exactly it's just not it's just not feeling like could aside i just i feel demoralized just again it feels demeaning to me to be like talking to big corporations about like making pennies <laughs> for the amount of work that I'm doing without mm-hmm. even being able to like have anything to show for it by the end of it except a broken body and mind you know mm-hmm. so it's kind of like yeah <laughs> not vibing with this <laughs> right now it's like recognizing that there are more important things and that you can't just keep burning yourself it's like because you have to you have to ask yourself sometimes for what like I know it's for money but like for what like what is yeah. it do I really have to show for this at the end of the day is it exactly. is it something that I'm really proud of, or is it just something that exhausted me for a long period of time? And I have some income, but that's gone because I have to pay bills and rent and all that stuff. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, just, looking at look my savings, I'm looking at my retirement, which and I have no retirement savings. I'm like, I can't. I have a you know, family that I am trying to help and take care of, and it's like I just you know, I love to draw, but I can do that on my own time too. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. oh, yeah, so yeah. one of those things I'm trying to figure out. <laughs> yep. There's absolutely no shame in that, by the way. Like, I feel like there's, I remember for the longest time before I took uh, my first non-creative job, I felt like such a failure that I took, had to take that step. And that's just not true. You're a human being and you do what you got to do. And I see it as a way to preserve your love for your art that you want to still be loving to do it. You know what I mean? And so even if uh, it means dedicating all your creative time to what you love to do, but it means that most of your time for a while, you're having to do other work to, to make ends meet that's I think that's a powerful step so I just wanted to say that that there's absolutely no shame to anybody listening that might be feeling the same way and feeling really down about it um don't you know and it's like no stage in your life either lasts forever so it's just you get through it however you can you know yeah and also if you find yourself not being able to make the profit off of your art like you want to or you find yourself compromising your mental health your stability your physical health for art that you're not even happy with making then it's okay to consider a separate stream of income. It's okay to do something completely different that's art and just doing your art on your own time because it makes you happy. The, yeah. There's no rule that says you always have to, if you're an artist, you only can make a profit off of your art and nothing else. There's mm. literally zero things that are saying that. So you have to figure out what's best for you and what works for you. And some people can make a ton of money off art and that's great for them. And some people have to do look, look at other things to, to make their income and focus on the art that makes them happy. And both ways are very valid ways of living and there's nothing wrong with either of those ways. So people put a lot of pressure on themselves or they feel ashamed if they have to get like a normal job. And I put air quotes because it's, you know, you were working. We're, I mean, art is a job too. Like, so this is all a job. We're all working. So exactly. there's no shame in, in, in taking up a different kind of, you know, of, of job or career at all. Um, and so like, it's funny because like, huh? Oh, sorry, go on. Oh, I was gonna, I muted myself because it was really loud outside. <laughs> um, but, and there's nothing to say that if you decide to explore a different career or a different field entirely that you can't go back. Yes. Like, 
yeah. I've, I've actually, I've done it. <laughs> you know? mm-hmm. I, I, I tried to make a living off my art. It didn't work out. I had to go into, what was it? I think I was like a temp for a while, just like, <laughs> just like plugging in and, and filling out forms for, for doctors and lawyers. And it was really like fine work. It paid my bills. So I didn't have to worry about it. But I also noticed that during that period, I was able to uh, feel rejuvenated with my work and finally like remember why I like drawing again and Mm -hmm. later on I was able to like years later I made it back into the animation industry and and like before then I was hip popping around in all these different fields so do what do what's best for you in the moment and nothing's nothing's final like Mia said right like it, it, it doesn't, the decisions that you're making now doesn't need to dictate the rest of your life, so, right. unless it's for the positive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When you're younger, a lot of things can feel really permanent when you're in it, but like, it's crazy how impermanent so many different things are. I had mm-hmm. no idea that I would end up where I am now based on how I started my career, based on how I went, to, what I went to college for, based on what I thought I would be when I was younger. Like, it's all changed and shifted. And yeah. It, and it's going to continue to change and shift mm-hmm. and all of those things are just like that's just a part of the journey so you have to just accept that and know that you can try different things and if you want to try the same thing that's fine too if you can make it work that's awesome but if you can't trying different things is great actually trying different things is awesome because you get different experiences and you can use that to make yourself more powerful <laughs> you, you have all these like multifaceted skills that you've suddenly picked up over the years and you can use that to influence your art you can use that to um you know make a better home for yourself. You can use that. I mean, you can use that for so many different things to improve your communication skills. I know Mia, in an episode, you talked about that before where, um, you know, working, working as a waitress helped with communicating with people and like, yeah, it, that's, and that's huge. So, you know, there's, you, the sky's the limit. You're, you're not limited by, by only having to do one thing. So hopefully that heartens y'all a little bit. I think but, it's really um, important to have a plan A, B, and C. I oh, see absolutely. a lot of young artists who refuse to have a plan B. Yeah. And that, you, nobody can break them out of that, in my opinion. I mean, I've tried and I've tried to tell people, you know, you have to have a plan B, especially in this industry. But all you can do is just watch sometimes and just let, let them make that decision for themselves, whether this is the hill that they want to die on, which is totally fine and valid, or if they want to take a step back and try something else that they love. The way that I see it is like, for me, right? I'm a costume designer, but what's analogous to costume designing? Character design and color styling, Mm -hmm. right? Um, I feel like if you wanna have a plan B and C, look at your plan A and figure out what in my plan A, I'm a background designer, what else do I do in that that is very important? Maybe cinematic moments, maybe color styling, maybe um, beat paintings, maybe, you know, background painting. That's four other very important positions right there. You know, so I say, I think it's really important if people, you know, if you want to be hyper-focused on one thing, remember that there are other things that's very similar to that one thing that you could be you know, even better at or get hired for if you allow yourself that sort of exposure. That's tough though to yeah, it's I don't know, to realize like, oh, the thing that I want to do for the rest of my life may not work out for me. That's scary. I've been there. It's- I had that exact <laughs> thought in my junior year of college. No. So I had my plan A, B, C, and D before I graduated. So I had three different portfolios before I walked out the door. My sci-fi fantasy portfolio, my storyboarding for animation portfolio, and children's book samples. And it wasn't until like 20 years later that I actually was able to show my, my children's book portfolio and get an actual children's book. So like there's, yeah, like (laughs) having, having backup, having a backup plan uh, for your art career, um, following your passions and and all that stuff. uh, It it eventually does pay off. I mean, you know, you never know when, (laughs) but. uh, 
But it will. It will. When you're dead. Like, <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <You're> dead. no. <laughs> Not when you're dead. Is that what you're trying to say, Eric? Because I'll say it for you. <laughs> no. <laughs> when everybody's looking at your stuff on, uh, you know, high-res computer screens oh, in a museum, and they're like, "Wow, look at the, look at wow. the brush strokes on that digital painting." Man, I wish this person could have worked on my movie. How beautiful right. that would mm. <laughs> yep. um, I was alive. <laughs> yeah. Who is what? Who is the name of that? Like stressing myself out working on something. I was just reminded of uh, this Japanese artist who's like had a blood clot or a vein or something huh. like that burst in his brain. What? Is it the Berserk? The Berserk? Yes. Movie? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Dude. Mm -hmm. Shoot. I'm I was like... I'm, not, I'm, gonna, I'm so mad that I can't get the name in my head right now. I was oh, like, I are you kidding me? Hold on. My friend is going to be so mad at me for not remembering the name of this artist. Wow. Because like what Edge was talking about, working 24 hours straight mm -hmm. on something and not really... You know, 48. it's not not really being worthwhile. <laughs> forty eight hours. Forty eight hours. Yes. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I'm not trying to pop pop capillaries and veins and whatnot up in my brain mm -hmm. over anything. I'm going to sleep. Yeah, yeah. right. You will just Can get that job up, late. <laughs> you will absolutely get it late. That's, That's the worst it. part too. Is that I did that and it was late because I couldn't oh. keep the pace. Oh, <laughs> and like it's like yeah. the worst part is having to explain to people that can draw or paint that you actually need to sleep yeah. you need to eat you need to not neglect your family <laughs> or your friends <laughs> or yourself <laughs> or yourself i'm a friend you know? neglector from time to time and i don't like it i really don't i i as well <laughs> but, but yeah like it's it's crazy because like I, I just had to experience this too where I was working on a big freelance project and finishing it and the deadline was there and it was looming and I had to tell the person, uh, my client, I was like, I, there's no, there's just, no, there's no way. Like, I, I, please, <laughs> please help. And he was like, yeah, that's fine. Like we can push it forward two weeks. And I'm like, excellent. I bet you work for me. So, you know, sometimes be realistic with what you're capable of. We were just talking about this in another episode too, but be realistic with what you, uh, what you know you can and can't do it's really easy to overestimate ourselves as artists because we've been in a point in our lives when we could deliver all of the things but when you keep going so suddenly you find you can't because you're exhausted and you need sleep so um and when you get older you need sleep so maybe you should sleep yeah, <laughs> and, and be like, realistic like, with yourself. But that's um, one of the like worst wake up calls as I've gotten older is like people aren't kidding when you hit thirty it like the body just goes no. Oh, <laughs> like yeah, yeah, really? Your body's dead. <laughs> awesome. like, How, yeah. We gotta go to bed now. Like, yeah. All nighters used to be no problem, and now it's like I'm up too late, and my next day is ruined. So it's, it's like struggle <laughs> nowadays. Oh my oh. gosh, what's happening? Yeah, in college, back when my brain was elastic and my bones were just like made of rubber, <laughs> it just didn't really matter <laughs> back then. Now, back when I used to wake up every morning and break my arms and my legs. And yeah, like, just you know, we just like get, break my glass lungs. Definitely gonna make art. <laughs> <laughs> But like, but now I spend four skin. hours. My knees are just I like. Got loads of paper skin. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Oh That's God. something I would suggest if you have to take a non-creative job, do something you can be on your feet if you can, because that's why I was waiting tables because I was like, I'm not going to be on my on my ass like all these hours. That's just, and now I'm doing that, and I feel like my body calcifying in this sitting position. Yes. Mm -hmm. oh, no. <laughs> Honestly, yeah, yeah. That's why I took up running. I, yeah. Me and my friends are training for a half marathon, and it's been so helpful because I used to have a lot of like back pain and wrist pain, and I think ever since I started working out more regularly, a lot of that has, has gone away because I'm not. I agree. Sedentary. <laughs> I even just I'm, got asked. Oh, oh no, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say real quick. I got a standing desk and one of those like stools that like the the it's not a stable, so it's like a ah! bar stool, and it like it tilts so that I can't sit like flat on it. I'm kind of like moving all the time, and it's mm -hmm. been so helpful with my lower back. I just have tons of lower back pain, but yeah. That's anymore. amazing. Mm -hmm. I I have a trainer now for the past two months, 
And I've decided in two years, I want to compete at like those Iron Woman competitions where you're oh, like yes. crazy stuff. Yeah, that's, that's what great. I want to do. But I feel amazing. Like my back doesn't hurt anymore. My, I mean, I have my knee issues, but I mean, I used to feel myself deteriorating and calcifying. We work in a sedentary ass job. Like, yes, yeah. yeah. sedentary yeah. as hell. And it's even uh, worse when you work from home, too, because it's like, yeah. even the commute is gone. Uh, <laughs> Just, like, going from my table to my fridge, back to my table, to yeah. my bedroom, back and then to my bed. And, it's like, and then to yeah. bed. Exactly. Yeah. And it's, like, it's like that. Nothing else. <laughs> It's like that meme that was like, I used to have a nine to five, but now I have a 24 seven because oh, yeah. we literally oh. have all the time to work now. Oh, and it's true. <laughs> it's so sad. It's so true. Yeah. I've had to compensate as well by getting a sit stand desk. And also um, my hobby, it sounds pathetic, but I've been playing DDR again. <gasps> yes, yes, DDR. Yeah. Oh my yeah. gosh. Okay. That's so pathetic. <laughs> Listen. I played DDR, ITG, and PIU from yeah. high school to uni and was hella competitive with my friends about it. Mm-hmm. I was too. I was very, very into DDR when I was in high school and I was great at it. And I was You'd be shape. proud of that. I had abs. Oh, it was, I was, so I'm trying to get back to that. Yeah. in my life where I actually have stamina again. You know, having something that helps you move around so that you're not just sitting down all day, super important to keep your body, um, you know, healthy. Uh, I got roller but, skates. Yeah, I, great. I would love to try that. <laughs> so much fun. Yeah. Um, but I think that this has been a great, this has been a great episode. Has, has does anybody have any advice to leave that? I, you know, I feel like people coming here, were probably expecting a way different talk. They're like, oh, I'm going to figure out how to make money off of the thing <laughs> I want to do. And, and instead we just, our old asses start talking about how to take care of your body while making money <laughs> off of it. <laughs> Because that's that's good advice. The 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 takeaway (laughs) the takeaway from the takeaway from this is do what you love, find something you know find something that makes you happy, do it well, uh, and you'll you know get the respect and the jobs and the and the you know all that goes along with that. um, Hopefully, do as we say, not as we do. Yeah, Yeah, as we say, not as God. (laughs) (laughs) And take care of yourself while doing it. And take care of yourself. You don't yeah, want to. Yeah, you want good knees, and you don't want to. You don't want hemorrhoids. So, <laughs> that's what it comes down to. That's, that's what it comes down to. You know what? Because we talk about this being a sedentary ass job. Not, you do not want hemorrhoids on top of trying to hit a deadline. You're like, I can't even sit down and work. <laughs> <laughs> Sciatic nerves is a joke too. That's just, you know, no, sciatic nerves are no joke. Yeah. Sciatic is a thing. Oh. Great. <laughs> I love hanging out with y'all so much. Is there any final piece of um of, of other advice? Uh, I know Eric, you just dropped a, a great nugget that you want to leave people with who are watching today. Be confident in your art and what you do. I think I think when you are more confident it's easier for people to believe in you not as to believe in what you're capable of i think uh the less confident you are though i feel like the less prepared you'll be for how hard the industry works you mm-hmm. like you have to be you got to be confident or at least fake it till you fucking make it yeah that's how i see mm-hmm. it absolutely ed you got anything um, I guess it's more of a, an echo of what we've been saying, which is like I, being okay with like keeping, like trying new things and mm-hmm. like ex- looking outside of perhaps like the one thing that you decide super early on is specifically all you want to do. Because even again, the income aside, I've been really surprised by where my art has gone just by exploring so many different other hobbies interests um it's like it's all feeds back into what i'm creating and as i become more of a full person my art changes and shifts with that too and becomes more so i feel like yeah like being open to new things that you might not consider otherwise could be really life-changing surprising ways (laughs) and that helps kristen i would just say be kind to yourself i i think a lot of us have a habit of 
either putting too many goals on our plate that need to be uh, completed by a certain amount of time and then we beat ourselves up if we can't meet that deadline like oh I've got to get all this done by the time I'm you know 25 or whatever or like life is like none of us could have predicted 2020 life is going to happen mm -hmm. what's important is that you identify your goals and as time goes on and as uh, your plan may shift that you continuously check in with yourself are these still my goals is this still something that i want to pursue uh if not what would make me happy you know and um and give yourself the space to to make mistakes it's okay so many mistakes so yeah. many mistakes and it's okay to cry too like oh yeah absolutely cry what I tell you common sense. it's okay to cry like do it absolutely cry it's frustrating. It is not easy not <laughs> to get in. It's easy as all hell to get out, but it's absolutely not easy to get in. And so it's okay to cry over frustrations when you feel like you're putting your all into it. Mm -hmm. um, and nothing is being given back to you. It's okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Mia. Um, I would just uh, lean into just pour your heart and soul into everything you do, you know, and, that, and that's actually how you make a connection with people. And uh, it's not so much about skill, you know, or, or any of that stuff. It, all that stuff is important. But at the end of the day, I think uh, the work is about making a connection with other people and people can sense when you love what you're doing and when you're putting your passion into it. And even if that's a small group of people, it's so gratifying to connect with someone on that level. And that's what I always, you know, try to go towards as opposed to chasing likes and chasing followers, all that stuff is external, but you can control what you put into your work, mm -hmm. you know? And so that's, that's at least what I try to follow. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think my last bit is, you know, really just try to, try to keep yourself, like try to, try to keep your authentic self as much as you can. It's really easy to lose it when you're chasing money. It's really easy to lose it when you think that people want a certain thing, kind of like what you were saying, Mia. But there's nothing worse than looking at your art and not recognizing who it came from. Always try to, to keep that part of yourself that, you know, like remember why you love making art if you're going to make it. And if you can't rem remember it, it's okay. It's okay to back away sometimes and reevaluate and try to do something else and then revisit it when you feel like you're in a better space to deal with it. But you know, do what you can to keep yourself healthy, you know, mentally and physically, and take care and have fun with your art. And that's really it. And that's all we got today. And I love how beautiful this magnum board turned out. Thank you so much, Brie, for adding beautiful colors on top of my piece <laughs> that I couldn't finish. <laughs> it's really nice. I always, I'm always here for a blush, like a, like a, like a, you know, yeah. Shoulder knee foot blush, like oh, a shoulder knee blush. My yeah. favorite thing ever. So, oh, Eric's Eric's did it too. But <laughs> thank you, thank you everybody at Lightbox and our viewers in Painted in Color for joining us today. This was a great conversation. So thank you, panelists, everybody. I know that we're all like remote and you can't really see this, but everybody give a round of applause for our amazing panelists. Even if you're just home, no one sees you. Just do it anyway because they all deserve <laughs> it. Look at them; they're all beautiful. <laughs> We will see you later and take care of yourselves. Thanks, everybody. Bye. 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 <laughs>